You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast, the most listened to daily Miami Dolphins podcast on the internet. Come on, Dolphins fans. Time to fins up. My guest today needs no introduction as he is the host of the Dan Patrick show, which you can catch every day on Peacock and here on Fox sports radio, Dan Patrick, Dan, thanks for a few minutes of your time today. Well, thanks for the invitation. Yes, absolutely. And you recently wrote a book, the occasionally accurate annals of football, the NFL's greatest players plays scandals and screw ups plus stuff. We totally made up. You can buy it on Amazon and at Barnes and Nobles or wherever you buy your books um this is a really funny book i bought this book not knowing what to expect and there's a lot of humor in this book and there's also a lot of the history of the nfl with the growth of the league as well from like a big picture aspect what made you want to write this book and have a project like this well i have a friendship with joel cohen he works for the simpsons he's a writer on the simpsons and he was writing an episode where i was going to be on the simpsons And once we got past that, and then he started asking me questions, football questions, just he, he doesn't have an outlet like I have. And he goes, you know, I got some questions I need answered. And so we just started talking back and forth. And then he goes, would you ever want to write a book? And I go, Oh God, no. He goes, well, I think we have something here. I go, where? He goes, no, this conversation, let's just, can I, let me write some stuff down. And then um, you write some stuff down. And I said, well, what am I writing down? He goes, I don't know. Do you have questions you want answered by the NFL about the NFL? And I go, I guess. And then we just, we just kept coming back together and collaborating. And then all of a sudden he goes, Hey, you know, I'm friends with Andy Richter from uh, Conan. He's got some questions. So all of his friends who had questions want to know if they could write some things. And I said, the more, the merrier. And then he just said, all right, I'm going to divvy this up. These are teams you write about or players you write about, eras that you write about, anything you feel confident, comfortable. And then we just went at it, kind of threw it in the blender and spit it out. Uh, But it was a lot of fun because, first of all, I, I like to think I can keep up with people in this business, but I had a hard time keeping up with Joel as far as, it. you know, I liken it to a tennis match, Mike, that... Um, I was an amateur and he was Federer and I kept going, Oh my God, I got to keep up with this guy. But he kept bringing up ideas and then they spawned more ideas and then we just rolled with it. And, uh, that's kind of how we have our conversations. It's, you just start talking, you go off on a tangent and, uh, next thing you know, you've written a chapter. Yeah. And it, it does come through in the book because like I said, it does have that, big picture history of the league all throughout the years, throughout the forties and fifties, sixties to where it is today. But the humor in there really stands out with a lot of these subjects. But um, a question for you though, is we see where the NFL is today and it's so big and it's so popular. It dwarfs every other sport combined. Mm -hmm. 2024 is the NFL almost too big to fail. Meaning could anything bring this sport down at this point? Whether, you know, people complain about too many rule changes and those stomp their feet and complain, they still watch. We had a former president. He attacked some players. He attacked some owners. People still watch. You've had, you know, racism lawsuits and stuff like that. Nothing really seems to affect. They're Teflon in a lot of ways. Could anything bring this sport down from where it is today, you think? A gambling scandal. I think if you that had... That was one I had on my list, yeah. Like a big-name quarterback... You know, you can have somebody who is, you know, maybe on the periphery of being a known player, star player. But if you had a quarterback who somehow was throwing games, I I would think gambling is what could bring down the NFL. 
and and bring down is maybe a harsh description because you're the right. popularity to an extent. Yeah. Yes, because a lot of the NFL, their popularity, its popularity is based off of fantasy and gambling. Well, you want to make sure that you have the integrity there that you're always going to know what you're gambling on is real. And you don't want it to be where all of a sudden there's an official who's on the take. Uh, you know, I there and usually you go to the like the lowest common denominator here. It's not the you know, the quarterback's making fifty million dollars. You're not gonna like he's not gonna be somebody you could approach. No incentive. Yeah. You could talk to an official. You could talk to somebody who uh, you know keeps stats if there's over unders. You know, this was brought up to me by an NBA official who said the one thing we have to worry about is with over unders, with uh, prop bets, with individual bets, the person who keeps our stats that they don't they could be approached. And they could be vulnerable that all of a sudden, if you say, hey, I got Josh Hart with uh, 13 rebounds over under, all of a sudden the person keeping the stats goes, uh, yeah, we got him for uh, 14 rebounds. It sounds crazy, but this, this is how these things start, where you go, oh, gosh, they, they got to that guy or that guy, uh, you know, Tim Donaghy, uh, Jonte Porter with the Raptors, where you just go, huh? Uh, so, I mean, the NFL knows this. Uh, Vegas knows this. You got to make sure you protect each other with this. But I would think gambling would be the only way to maybe put a dent in the NFL. Yeah, that would hurt the popularity for sure. Um, and it's funny you mentioned the NBA because something I've sort of thought about here in the past week or so as there's talk of going to an 18 game regular season, pushing back the Super Bowl to President's Day weekend holiday. If you're Adam Silver and the NBA, first off, <laughs> Christmas Day was always their day. Now they're coming in the NFL going, we don't care if it's on a Wednesday or Tuesday. We're playing games. We'll make it work. Now if they push it back to President's Day weekend, the Super Bowl, that's the NBA All-Star game, which we clearly have to move. Are they looking at the NFL game, you know, being like, what do we ever do to you guys to make you want to <laughs> just, just push us, you know, off to the side and not even think twice about it? What must the NBA be thinking right now? Um Please don't hurt us any more <laughs> yes, than you already exactly. have. It's almost, you know, when you have Godzilla – uh, bouncing around New York City, you just hope that they're not stepping on your skyscraper. And the NBA has reason to be upset slash disappointed. A lot of those uh, commissioners, at least I remember, they were friends with each other. I don't know if it's that way anymore. I'm sure that Adam Silver and, uh, you know, Commissioner Goodell are friendly, but I don't know Gary Bettman, who used to work with David Stern. I, I don't know how that works, the inner workings yeah. of that, but. If I'm David uh, if, or if I'm uh, Adam Silver, I at least call the commissioner to say, you know, help us out here. You know, that's yeah. our all star weekend. Now, I've said for the last couple of years that they should move the Super Bowl back. It should be President's Weekend. You should be able to do it in conjunction with the day off for your fans. And it just it, it makes sense. As far as Christmas, uh, you know, that's gifts for everybody. I, yes. I, I'm not going to complain. You're not going to complain. Nope. The commissioner's going to complain, but nobody cares. It's like, hey, we got all of this on Christmas Day. Great. So there's no real outcry. Nobody's complaining going, oh, come on. Christmas Day's for us, the NBA fan. Wait, we got NFL? Oh, yeah, screw them. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> yeah, it's just a lot more options. Um, but it is funny how just, you know, the NFL is just like, we had one holiday in November where we sort of owned – we want to own that one too. And we don't yeah. care who else is out doing stuff. But, you know, when you're that big and powerful, you can do pretty much anything you want. And plus, there's people throwing money at them to do this. As we heard a rumor yesterday that Netflix might want to air the games on Christmas. That's more money into the pot for the NFL. Um, in the book, you talked about officiating in a very funny way. But in a serious matter, I thought that chapter, you know, hit on some points that there's a lot of rules. And I've said this on my, like, the, I think. Part of the reason fans get so frustrated with the NFL officiating is not so much the ref. It's just there is so much on the plate of an NFL referee. Like, if we sat down, just to, like, we could probably come up with four or five rules off the top of our head. Like, are these needed? <laughs> like, you know, two men um, in motion on offense. Who cares if it's one guy in motion or two? If there's an, you know, if the tight end is not covered up on the end of line scrimmage, who cares? It's not going to affect the play any. You got fumble through the end zone, the tuck rule. 
I could probably sit here and come up with eight more. You know, like, are there literally too many rules in this sport now? Yes, and they keep adding, Mike. They're not subtracting, and they add to the existing rule. It So it feels like it's always lawyered up, where you're just going, like, really? Are, is somebody going to, like, sue us because this rule, you know, it, it's too complicated or uh, you didn't enforce it? Like, you just – you want to be able – well, you know, complete the process. When, when Calvin – uh, Johnson caught that touchdown pass against the Bears years ago, and he didn't complete the process. And I went, holy shit, we're in trouble now. Because <laughs> I don't, completing the process. And I worried about that. Now, I, I caught the ball, I went out of bounds. Did I, you know, complete the process? Did I have full control? It's just, I think it makes the referee's job even tougher, and it's the toughest job that we have. And now you're adding to it. You want your officials to be great. You don't want to open up the, uh, uh, he, he, that's not a touchdown. He didn't complete, you know, the act, D you know, the NFL keeps doing this and I'm not sure why, because I would, I would simplify and they, yeah. it feels like they're over, uh, over amplifying. The player safety rules I get, because you want to have it be safe for the player. So that, um, but some of these other rules, it's like, it's just, so minutia that doesn't have any effect on the play at all. But I have problems uh, with the safety rules from the well, standpoint some of, of it too. Well, yeah. if I'm a defensive player, I have to ask the commissioner at some point, can you give us a rule that benefits us? Because basically every rule that you've imposed has been to our detriment. We're not allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do that. We can't hit them there. Can't hit them there. Can't hit them there. If you land on them, you got to roll. If it's a quarterback, you've got a bread basket that you can hit, and that's it. And uh, now we're going to review roughing the passer. We want to make sure, you know, we're protecting. I get it. We protect the quarterback. But at, at what expense? You want to make sure that when that defensive player goes in, that he's able to be a defensive player and not – the guy, you know, uh, your your guard at uh, school with kids going across the uh, the walking guard, whatever that is. Like, we're just yeah. going to protect everybody here. We don't want anybody to get hurt instead of it's still football. And I at times that that bothers me that I don't think you you allow the defense to actually play defense. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's a lot of it's a lot on the plate of the NFL officials. I don't envy their job, but I think that's why we see so many. Mistakes might be a strong word, but so much confusion at times. It's like, well, this rule doesn't really matter. Why, why even spend a five minutes on it? But it happens a lot. Now, our podcast reached a lot of fans of the Miami Dolphins. So I want to get your thoughts on Mike McDaniel, the head coach. What's your view of him? He's not your typical NFL head coach in any way, shape, or form. He's in the fashion. He likes to tell jokes at the press conferences. Um, knows how to coach offense. That's one thing for sure. And also your thoughts on... To a tongue of Ilo, who's always a hot topic when you talk about NFL quarterbacks and where he sort of falls in your, you know, in your mind these days amongst the other current NFL quarterbacks, um, where he falls. Is he, you know, you know, I hate the top 10, top five, but where do you think he is currently today? Well, let me start with your coach, who I love, went to Yale and he's just uh, he's unique. And, and I think that I have an even greater appreciation after watching Hard Knocks with how he coaches you know, especially Tyreek Hill. And, and and you just get that feeling of he's 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 got a vibe going on with these players that he talks with them, to them, not at them. Um, you know, I grew up with coaches that you just you didn't talk back, you didn't have a conversation, you were spoken to, and that was it. But I I I think that's what football is about. It's going into the lab and coming up with something. Like, what are you doing that's different? And it feels like he's doing something different. And therefore, I'm fascinated. Now you bring in OBJ. Uh, that's fun. I love it. And then it helps. His offense too. is fun. Yes. His offense is going to have a lot of speed, a lot of fun. And I and I like Tua the person. I've met him a few times. I've met his parents a couple of times. And, you know, I worried about him, you know, after those concussions that, you know, is he is is it safe for him to continue to play? And last year, you know, he survived. I mean, that's really what you do at that position. You you kind of survive each year. It's hard to play all the games, but the number of hits, uh, trying to avoid those, and 
you know, it feels like he knows what he can and can't do. He's never going to be confused with somebody who says, man, can that guy throw deep? It's Steve Young said to me, it's not how far you throw it. It's where you throw it when you throw it far. And he said, it's about accuracy. And this is a guy who completed over 70% of his passes one year. We get caught up in the prototype. You got to look like Dan Marino. Well, Dan Marino in today's game would be different than Dan Marino back in the 80s. He would play differently. Uh, you know, Duper and Clayton, uh, Nat Moore. I mean, you don't have guys who are throwing deep as much as they used to. But that ability to be able to check down, hit the right guy. Plus, if I have Tyreek Hill, all I say is, hey, get open two, years down, two yards down the field, and I'm going to throw it to you. Because we both get credit for a 70-yard touchdown. I throw it two, you go 68, it's still a 70-yard touchdown pass. So I like that with Waddle. OBJ, maybe there's something there now as the third person. The only thing I worry about with him is at any point you say, I mean, he wants to prove that he's still a lead or great. He wants his touches. Oh, and yeah. that would concern me when you go back to the huddle, because this happened in Cleveland with Baker Mayfield. I really think that's where Cleveland got sidetracked is Baker tried to be OBJ's friend. Hey, I'm going to keep throwing you the ball to the detriment of the offense there. Cause Jarvis Landry was the better receiver that year, but that would be the only thing that would concern me. If he plays, plays well, that's a great luxury. And I know there's some incentives. He can make close to $8 million. I don't rank of uh, quarterbacks, by the way, yeah. back to what you were saying with, yeah. two of, I don't know if he's a top 10. Like I, I don't care if he is or isn't. Now that might be Dolphins fans. Hey, we got a top 10 quarterback. I just want a, a, a consistently good quarterback who might, you know, be on the verge of greatness. But if I put him up there in the top 10, well, can he live up to that? Like, what is a top 10 quarterback? I don't even know anymore. I, I hate yeah. it too, but it's like, I don't know any other way to ask like your thoughts on two. It's like, because you compare him to it. Cause he's about, he is about to sign a contract that's going to pay him like a top three or so quarterback, which we know most people know, I should say that that's always happening. Cause the next guy who gets paid is always usually the highest and someone else is going to get paid. He'll top him and someone else is going to. So that's like, but I think a lot of fans just not of the Miami Dolphins, but NFL fans, like you can't pay him that. Okay. Would you rather it. have Dak Prescott or Tua? Tua. Tua. Not even close. Not even close. Cause I've seen, Two, I have I haven't seen him in enough big spots. Let me down yet. Dak, I've seen him in a lot of big spots. Let me down. So I still got a sliver of hope. Two is going to okay. come through. And, and I think I think a lot of the problems with Miami. It's not even problems. Some of the issues they had versus when they played teams that were good last year was not necessarily Tua. It's running games working. They get away from the run two or the smaller stuff like that that people who really watch the games would see. Um, I don't think it's him. I you know so. I don't know. Look, we're all fans of Dolphins like myself. We're hoping for the best. We're hoping for the best here. But, yeah, I'd rather have two of them Dak today on, you know, May 9th, 2024. Ask me one year from today. Maybe I'll change my mind. I don't know. But I think that's where we are today. But I think the Cowboys expect Dak to be something more than he is. I True. don't know if the Dolphins expect Tua to be something more than he is. I, I, I think that Mike puts him in a position of this is your comfort zone. It still feels like Dallas thinks that Dak's going to be Troy Aikman all of a sudden. He and, and, and he's just he is who he is. I don't think he's all of a sudden going to be something greater than than this. And he's had weapons. And so and they they've been substandard when it comes to the playoffs. You get blown out by Green Bay at home. You had the mess against the Niners, you know, and it comes back to the quarterback as well with that. It starts there and the head coach. So Yeah, and I think it goes back to what Charles Barkley and Shaq say sometimes. Some guys drive the bus. Some guys are on the bus. I think the Cowboys are asking him to drive the bus, and he might be a guy who should be part of a bigger system where he's not asked to do as much. Yeah. And not like, not like Josh Allen or Joe Burr, who they asked – to do so much for those teams. You know, some guys can, and you can still win, just not with your quarterback being asked to do everything. And I think that's where those two quarterbacks sort of can be successful if put in the right situation. And we'll see with Miami. Last question for you, because I don't want to take up too much of your time here. Um, 
Super Bowl. You talk about that a lot in the book, the history of the Super Bowl, Super Bowls. I know you covered a lot of Super Bowls for NBC. And I always get fascinated with after the game, the podium, who wins. You're and you've been in that spot where you've got 100 million people watching you at that moment. And you want to hear from the key people. You want to hear from the quarterback. You want to hear from any other player that made a big impact in the game. You want to hear from the head coach. But you also have to get a few words in from the owners. And it's like, how do you, someone who's in that moment, the whole world's watching, navigate who gets how much time? Because you want to get a taste from, uh, I mean, you want to hear from everybody. But you don't want to hear too much from one person knowing your time is limited. How did you ever, how did you navigate that whole process? Well, you have a system. So I handed out the Super Bowl trophy four times and all four were different because, you know, let's go to the Steelers against the Cardinals. Ben leads them down two minute drill. Santonio Holmes catches the touchdown pass. I'm assuming Ben is the MVP. Ben's on the podium. And I think Ben thinks he's the MVP. Well, the MVP was Santonio Holmes. I got the commissioner saying to me, as we're watching, uh, I think Joe Namath bring the trophy up and the commissioner goes, are you going to introduce me? Are you going to introduce me? So we're ready to go on in front of a hundred million people watching sold out crowd. The commissioner saying, are you going to introduce me? Yeah. Yes. I'll introduce you. Then I'm looking to see, you know, uh, Mr. Rooney is up there. Uh, you know, Mike Tomlin. So all of a sudden you're just taking inventory. Now I got to do commissioner. I introduce, he gives the trophy. I talk to the owner usually one, maybe two uh, questions. Then I want to talk to the coach. Then I want to talk to the MVP. If the MVP is not the quarterback, then I want to get him. Now I have a finite amount of time to get all of this done. The problem that I've had before is uh, Jeffrey Lurie, the Eagles owner, and he wanted the microphone and you can never give up the microphone on the podium ever, you never ever. Get it back. No, yeah. because he said, Hey, you know, I want to, I, I want to say some things, and that's not a good thing to hear. Like, this isn't live at the improv. Uh, you know, there's some big advertising dollars here at stake. Well, he grabbed he grabbed the microphone, and I, I'm i pulling it back. Like, you don't realize this on TV. Yeah. It also happened to one of the Giants owners. He grabbed it, and we're fighting, and he's bigger than me. And you can see that I'm trying to get that microphone back. I'll hold it. You're not holding it. Because if you hold it, you're going to continue to talk. Um, Eli Manning was up there. He had won the MVP beating the Patriots. And he worked, I think, or represented uh, Toyota. He got a black-on-black -black Corvette. And I'm reading off a card. And the Super Bowl MVP is uh, Eli Manning. And you've won the Chevrolet, blah, 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 blah. So I'm reading this. I look around, and Eli's off the podium. And I, I look at, I go, Eli, I'm yelling on national TV. I'm, Eli, Eli. And he's walking down the steps. He comes back up and I gave him the keys. I said, here, like I was so pissed at him because I'm up there holding the keys to the Corvette. He didn't want to be seen with the Corvette because he had a car dealership. Paid by Toyota. Yes. Um, trying to think if there was any, uh, any other, all the, uh, Kevin Hart was drunk and wanted to get up on the podium when the Eagles won. And I'm hearing him. So I'm I'm up there and I have my IFB in. So to drown out the noise, uh, they're in my ears. And my producer can talk to me. So I have that in. All of a sudden I hear this. But I but I'm the biggest, I'm the biggest Eagles fan ever. I, I should be up there. Why, why can't I get and I'm going, that's Kevin Hart. So I'm interviewing. Doug Peterson, and I can see Kevin Hart yelling at the security people because he thinks he's supposed to be up there on the podium. And I'm going, God, don't let him up here. And I've since talked to Kevin about yeah, this. Yeah. I said, you were drunk trying to get up there. And he goes, I, I yeah, I was. I, I should have been up there. And I go, no, no. you. But, but at the time, and then I got Nick Foles, and I'll, I can still hear Kevin. And I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I got to get, I got to get off the podium because Kevin wants to get up here. So things happen so quickly when uh, you had the Russell Wilson uh, interception uh, that, you know, Malcolm Butler has the biggest play in the history of the Super Bowl. He wins the Super Bowl with an interception. Well, we're up on the podium and I, in my mind, Tom's getting the MVP truck. 
and I'm going, I, I'm going, I'm thinking in my mind, like, and I said, well, I hope you let Malcolm drive it a little bit. I wanted to say now give it would to him. Be a good he deserves time. it. Uh, yes, <laughs> now would be a good time to give Malcolm the truck. I Mike almost said it. And there's part of me <laughs> that, that great. I wish I would have said it because it was true. Tom wasn't the best quarterback that day. Russell nope. Wilson was until that horrible call. But Malcolm Butler made that interception. That was I was right behind. I'm right underneath the goalpost because I'm going to be out for the trophy ceremony. Yeah. And I went, holy shit, Malcolm Butler. Oh, he knocked that down. And then all of a sudden they're scrambling and, and I'm, I'm 25 yards away. And I go, he got the ball. And all of a sudden the Patriots came out, ran out the clock, and then we're up on the podium. And it was just one of those where you go, like you can never say, well, this game's over. That was, that was, I'm watching Marshawn Lynch. So Russell's over here, calling the play, and I'm looking at Marshawn Lynch because I think he's just coming right in, right in to me, right underneath the goalpost, scored a touchdown, yep. they win. And I watch, and I see that he's not getting the ball. I look over, and I went, oh, bleep. Russell was throwing the ball. And then I was like, oh, God. At least, okay, it only got knocked down. And then Malcolm got the ball, and I go, Malcolm Butler just won the Super Bowl. And I, I would have said that to Tom. I told Brady about that later. I said, yeah. I almost said that. And then he just smiled. He didn't say, you know, you're right. I should give the yeah, truck to Malcolm. Yeah. Yes. He, and he if knows. I said to Tom, hey, Tom, you're going to win this game, but you're not going to get the MVP truck. We're going to give it to Malcolm Butler. If I said that before the Russell play, he would have said, absolutely. Because yeah. all Tom cared about was winning the Super Bowl. Winning. And Malcolm, that, that would have been a nice gesture if Tom goes, hey, Malcolm, come on up here and get your keys to your truck. Wow. Yeah, that would have been – you would have gone down in history for that one. It would have been funny in the moment, live TV. That's why live TV is great. Oh, it I know. Been awesome. I it, know. it would have been awesome. But, Dan, thanks so much for a few moments every time. Everybody, buy this book. You will have a bunch of laughs. Also, it does go over the history of the NFL as well in a fun way because a lot of these books about football, it's like – you know, people talking about like they take it so seriously. Some of these books, it, it, this is not. This is a fun view, and you will laugh. The occasionally accurate annals of football, the NFL's greatest players, play scandals, and screw ups, plus stuff we totally made up. Dan, thanks so much. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate it. Good luck to the yep. Dolphins. Uh, I'm hoping. <laughs>